we are gonna be talking about the harsh reality <laughs> of your diet. So maybe not your diet if you're not currently dieting, but if you have dieted in the past, then you will likely notice that a lot of this does pertain to you. So thank you. So welcome all you first timers. For those of you guys who do not know me, my name is Kiki. I am a personal trainer, I'm a strength coach, I am an author, I'm also a trainer's trainer, which means that my love is in training other trainers to work with the over-dieted population. So those who've experienced a lot of yo-yo dieting, uh, they feel like they've uh, experienced some metabolic damage from constantly under eating, or you know, they just don't really know what's going on with their metabolism. That's why I help the trainers that deal with them, and of course, helping my own clients, which that's one of them there. <laughs> that's saying yes she is so of course she thinks I'm amazing um I pay her to say that <laughs> just kidding I am also the co-founder of Eat More to Weigh Less so this is what we do and we are talking today about the harsh reality of diets in general so I put your diet if you're dieting <laughs> hopefully you're not doing something extreme but many of us have in the past or many of us don't really understand why we can't stick with any diet so I want to bring to light something that is it's starting to be discussed a little bit more in the industry but you kind of have to dig for it so it's not as easily <laughs> and you're not paid Gina thank you so I don't pay her so thank you there's a free compliment right there and I don't pay Teresa to compliment me either so the thing that I do want to point out though about diets is you know we hear a lot about yeah she's not we hear a lot about the fact that you know yo-yo dieting makes it harder to you know to lose the weight every time we see it for ourselves that yo-yo dieting you know like I am just like most of you are watching this, you know, you're duped by the industry and you diet and diet and diet and then one day you find yourself actually like gaining weight on what used to be the calories that you were able to lose on before. So while we understand that there is a problem with the yo-yo dieting and it gets harder every time and even some of us get that, you know, something happens with our metabolism when we do it, one thing that is not spoken about as often is the fact that dieting in its form that we've come to know it in, in the past, like probably 10, 15, 20 years, is not so far removed from eating disorders. And this was something that for me, it was a hard pill to swallow because like I said, I dieted with the best of them. You know, I started like, I think slim fast, like for my wedding, that was like my first diet. And then it just like kept going from there. So it was just like back and forth, back and forth for, you know, years and years on end of trying all these different diets. And I've come to, in the past few years, work really closely with some of who I feel are the best dietitians in the industry. One of them is Leslie Schilling, who I've had even on here a few times to interview and talk to you guys. I've also done a few interviews with her on our The Expert series of interviews. You can see clips of those. Yes, Slim Fast was the thing. You can see clips of those interviews on my YouTube channel as well. But what... I found in working with these dietitians is that this philosophy really is correct because a lot of what I do with my clients and what they do with their disordered eating clients is not much different. And the reason that we've noticed is that mentally and physically, some of the things that are happening to us during all these diet stints that we're going through are the same whether or not you're getting, because a lot of times we think eating disorder and we automatically think of yes it's a good thing you were able to stick to a diet so when we think disordered eating we may think of a person who is you know extremely emaciated like they they're super thin or someone that you know will look on tv and it's very easy for us to point out someone who is maybe too thin and easily assume that they are under eating or we can look at someone and maybe tell by the way their face is their eyes are sunken and their face is kind of like really really skinny and it's something that maybe then that's the picture that we get in our head. So it's really hard for us to think of ourselves as having any type of disordered eating mentality, or if we are looking at someone else who is, we can look at someone who is very, very thin, 
and assume that they're eating too little or see them eating too little, exercising a lot and think there is something wrong there, here's a problem. Whether we're looking at maybe like our children or someone you don't know or someone famous, it's very easy to make that assumption. But we can look at someone or ourselves who are overweight or our clients even, who's doing the exact same thing. They're executing the exact same behavior and we can call it a diet and we can excuse the behavior, even if they're going through so much of the same stuff, whether it be mentally or physically. So I'm gonna go over some of the things that happens, both mentally and physically, when you're on a diet, and what I've learned out of the years of research, and like I said, working very closely with dietitians who work with the eating disorder population, and let you know that a lot of these things go hand in hand. Yes, loving yourself is a huge, huge breakthrough because it's gonna work on either front. So mentally, some of the things that we see in dieting, and like I said, there's now there's wider categories of disordered eating, so we're starting, the, the National Eating Disorder Association is starting to notice now that you can't just group people into these categories of, you know, okay, if they're very skinny and they're over-exercising or under-eating, then they're in this realm of disordered eating. If they're not very skinny, but, you know, they're under-eating and maybe binging and purging, you know, so before, back when a lot of us grew up, there was maybe just anorexic and bulimic. Now we have ADNOS, E-D-N-O-S, which is eating disorder, non other specified. And we're also seeing uh, BED, which is binge eating disorder. And we're also seeing what has just recently come to light in the last year or so, which is orthorexia. And that's one of the topics that I had uh, dietitian Leslie Schilling on here before to talk about, and that's when healthy eating goes too far. So, and many of these stem from, you know, that first diet and they may take us in multiple directions, but mentally what we're seeing is there is a, yeah, it started as a diet. So when you start having these feelings of maybe binging and purging looks different for you. So we may think of binging and purging, like I said, many of us grew up with only anorexia and bulimia as the categories for eating disorder. So, you know, we had our after school specials and we just thought, okay, the person that you see them eating and they run straight to the bathroom, they're, you know, maybe they have a problem and, you know, alert the authorities. But maybe what we are not looking at is that many of us, when dieting, take on that same mentality. We may not be running directly to the bathroom right after our, you know, maybe we have a huge binge or we go out to eat, but we're thinking about how we're going to burn it off. We're thinking about, okay, how can I make up for this mishap? I, I messed up, so I need to, you know, not eat at the next meal, or I need to exercise for an extra 20 minutes, or I need to, and you're, and you're trying to figure out a way to undo this damage. It's the same mentality of the person that is binging and purging. You are using maybe exercise as a way of purging the calories. We're using, you know, like I say, maybe withholding food from ourselves at another time to make up for not, you know, for overeating at another time. So notice that type, that binge purge mentality and note it for what it is. It's not always going to be the thing that is noticeable or obvious. You may feel like, oh, well, mate, I'm so bloated, I need to remove, you know, a certain food from my diet until this goes away and then you add it back in. So there's different things that we do to try to skew that when we feel like we've done something wrong and we're like, okay, I got to make up for this some way. Whereas a natural tendency, something that would be a more natural reaction would just be to just move on at the very next meal. To not like each meal is its own thing. Each moment is a new start over moment. You don't have to punish yourself in this moment for what happened last moment or three moments from now or the next five meals because like, oh, I was so bad last week. I have to be so great this week. So notice the difference in the thinking when there's a disordered, some type of disordered mindset versus a healthy regulated mindset. Another example would be a all or nothing type thinking thinking that you're either on a plan or off a plan. That's the diet mentality kind of shows us that, but that's the same way that a person with, that's where the bench purge mentality comes from. That's where the person with anorexia and some of the formerly, you know, only diagnosed eating disorders that we had before came into play. A person felt like they had this need to be perfect. 
that's where the all or nothing thinking comes in. It's like, I have to be perfect. And if I'm not perfect, then screw it all. If I'm not perfect, then I just totally messed up and there's like no going back. So it's like, I ate one donut, I should just eat eight. <laughs> like that type of mentality, that is a disordered eating mentality. And for many of us, that comes from the dieting. It comes from literally having these plans that did not work in real life. They only work when you're dieting and you don't really understand how to have flexibility when you need it. So as soon as you move off of it, you're, you're lost. You're like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do because I, I'm off the plan. So I'll just start the plan over tomorrow. So that's, that's kind of the all or nothing thinking. Whereas again, like I said before, it's just, you just move on. You just go to the next meal and it is what it is. And you don't have to, you know, throw the whole day out of the window. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You just move on. You still get in your workout that day. You don't throw everything out. So if you find yourself with that tendency of like, I missed my workout today and yesterday. So I'll just wait and start working out again next week or something like that. Or I missed my workout yesterday. So what's the point of even trying today? Just keep going. It's not about the falling off. It's about, yes, I messed with the point, I eat the whole box. So it's not really about, if you'll fall off because we're human, we're all going to, you know, go to what would seem to be off plan. We're all gonna do something that's imperfect at some point and you don't punish yourself for that. You don't look at it as something that you, you know, you have to do it one way or else not at all. You can still incorporate life. Like you're, whatever you're doing for your fat loss, should be <laughs> yes, Gina, my eyes are on you. So, you know, try to resist that all or nothing. It's it's okay to live in the gray area. I like to say, like, just embrace the gray area. It's okay. Now, another one that I would say is a nutritional dogma. So this is something that this is where a lot of us tend to, and this is very often, you know, it's very popular in the fitness industry because so many of us are we're overly consumed with what, you know, the good foods and the bad foods and we're on top of all the research and we're like, okay, and this, and here's this superfood. And that's why like I held up the, you know, the clean eating in the beginning, because that's those of us who get really, really into that. You can find yourself going down this trail of nutritional dogma. And that's where one type of eating is there's like a hierarchy and you're constantly trying to find, and this is where you cross the line of orthorexia, where you're constantly trying to find the highest level of nutritional purity. And that is a slippery slope because like I said, in the fitness industry, it's very easy to do because you do want to be healthy. And so the more things that you find out about and you're like, oh my gosh, and I need to give up high fructose corn syrup and I shouldn't have sucrose and I shouldn't have gluten and I shouldn't have, and you just keep going and it ends up becoming a very slippery slope to where eventually you've eliminated everything for the sake of trying to have this ultimate level of purity and feeling like those who cannot do that are weak in some way. That is also something that when we've studied anorexia in the past, that was what leads to anorexia and it's this feeling of ultimate control, having control over something to the highest extent. That is typically the mindset that's behind the anorexic person. And now we're seeing also with the orthorexic person. So having that and a lot of the, a lot of the different diet plans that are out now are like that. They are, you know, they create, there's almost like a cult following behind every new diet plan. And, you know, and then we see there's forums and there's Facebook groups for them. And there's like these, you know, we rally behind this certain way of eating. And then that's the only way to eat. And people who don't eat like that, like, will just not get results. And they're beneath us. And, you know, and then even within the group, it's like, well, are, are do you eat the lentils or not? You know what I mean? And it's like, there's just, there's, you're constantly trying to get to a higher level. And while there's nothing wrong with wanting to be healthy, we have to watch out for the mental aspects of it because healthy can go too far. It can become a slippery slope that mentally takes you down a path that you don't wanna to go to. I, you're welcome, I'm glad that this information is helping you. So those are just a few of the, the mental connections that we're seeing between both dieting and eating disorders. 
and now there's another one that kind of crosses the line between because I'm going to talk about some of the physical aspects now but there's one that kind of crosses the line between the physical and the mental and that's the fact that there's there's a literal brain power that is slowly lost with disordered eating and that's because of the fact that especially if you're eating too little you're not eating enough to nourish your brain which then we cross over into the malnutrition aspect of what we're seeing with a lot of diets so literally your brain starts shutting down along with other vital organs of your body which we don't realize because we're thinking well i'm not again i'm not super skinny so even though you can imagine the person with anorexia maybe going through some of these issues it's really hard for us to imagine a person who is overweight going through the same physical issues as someone with anorexia or something like that so one of the issues that like I was talking about with the brain power is going to be the malnutrition diets especially as we're starting to see them in the last couple of decades are really leaving the majority of the, the population that are trying them undernourished as far as nutrition so we're, we're seeing malnutrition now in people that are overweight and obese and this is something that we, we didn't connect the dots on you know many years ago we've always connected the dots to starvation and malnutrition but again we think starvation we think very thin we think a person that we can look at and see like wow they are starving but we don't what we don't see now is that we have people that are part of the overweight population part of the obese population that are also malnourished and that is because of the extremity of some of these diets so the same way that starvation and not having enough food would lead to this malnourishment because of so many of these diets now are extreme where we're removing entire food food groups, entire macronutrient groups from our diets in order to lose weight, there's nothing that replaces the nourishment that this thing was giving our bodies. So it's something that it again can cause a slippery slope when we start removing things that we didn't necessarily need. Because sometimes we may see someone else doing something that they had to do for health reasons and then we take on that as well they did that for health reasons but they lost weight so now I'm going to do this to lose weight, but we should not take someone else's diagnosis and their dietary needs for what they need to control a disease and apply it to ourselves if it's not applicable. So it's very possible to be overweight and malnourished. And along with that means that now we're seeing that you can be, not, you can receive literally all of the cons of what we would see of a person with anorexia but none of the perceived benefits like weight loss. So you can go through all of the exact same things that that's person, that that person would go through, but not be skinny, but not be super thin. And because of that, it, it becomes harder to make the connection that physically you're malnourished, that physically you're under eating. This means that you can experience the, yes, yes, gluten would be a great example of that because not everyone needs to remove gluten from their diet. So, but it, it became a big thing now that celiac is more in the spotlight and people with it are now, they're having more options. And then we have people who have no idea what, what gluten is or why it would be bad. But because we see gluten free everywhere, we're just like, I don't need to have gluten. Not everyone needs to remove gluten from their diet and people who are ill-informed about gluten and the reason why you would need to remove it out of your diet they just pick any and everything that's gluten free and those things could be completely horrible compared to the gluten versions because just because something's gluten free doesn't mean that it's healthy so it's really important to understand the difference and why you would be choosing that if you're choosing it in order to you know become more educated or you want to eat more whole foods then you wouldn't just pick just all gluten-free variations of all the junk food that you're already eating because then it's just the same thing so yes gluten would be a great example of that um, I'm trying to think of another example that would be applicable that oh like going vegan or vegetarian even some people may eat that way because of a religious conviction because of a personal conviction about eating animals because of a personal conviction about you know earth sustainability and because of how you know how well they do on it they may become a proponent for it. and we have to watch putting something that we may feel very nostalgic about onto the general population as it must be this way so when we do that 
especially, you know, it's our responsibility as trainers and people that are leaders in the fitness industry to be very careful about doing that and to understand that something that is a preference to us and that works well for us isn't necessarily the need for the general population. Um, replacing meals with shakes, that it just depends on if it's convenient for you and if the shake has the same nutrients as the meal would, then that's great. But if it's like, like I said, like back in the day, like with some class, like a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and then a sensible dinner, like if that's leaving me like 800 calories for the day, then it's not nearly enough to replace a meal. I would just add in the shake to get some extra like nutrients or protein or something like that. Can vegetarian be done well? Yes, it can. So it's not that, again, it's not that you can't or shouldn't be vegetarian. It's just a matter of making sure you know why you're doing something. Don't, I, I have done a scope on this in the past. Should you go vegetarian to lose weight? No, you should not do any of those things for weight loss. You should not go gluten free for weight loss, become a vegetarian for weight loss, become vegan for weight loss. You should do those things because that, that's your conviction or you have a specific health reason for doing them. But doing them for weight loss is not realistic because I have clients for you know all shapes and sizes and all types of diets. So there you can be an you can be an obese vegan, you can be an obese vegetarian, you can eat completely gluten free and still be obese. So it's those things don't actually equate to weight loss. We've somewhere we mix the signals and that's like the message that's getting out there, but that's not necessarily the case. So just be aware of like Patty said it is. It could be a slippery slope. And again, for some people, becoming vegetarian or vegan can be a form of orthorexia. It can have it could be something that started from an intent to do you know to be very healthy and then it just kept going from there so it's really a matter of doing it for the right reasons so if you're not doing it for the right reasons then that's just something to be aware of now so the other thing that i will my dogs are going crazy so i might have to log off here soon because i think maybe somebody's at the door i don't know so with the uh, malnourishment i'll just go ahead and cover those really quick you may, if you see like signs of like a swollen belly, swollen legs, you're getting a lot of like infections and sickness and, uh, or low energy levels, anemic, low blood sugar. <laughs> yes, my dog is like that. Um, your tooth enamel, um, wearing out or hair falling out or nails, um, you know, being brittle and breaking off and stuff like that. Those are the same things that a person with an eating disorder would experience that, um, a person who is also overweight but starving themselves can experience the same things like loss of uh, menstrual cycle and things like that and apparently somebody is in my door so <laughs> I'm totally gonna have to run I'm sorry to cut things short but I just wanted to point some of those out that there is a fine line between um, disordered eating and dieting they can be very, very similar if you are not extremely, extremely careful. So I would do everything within your power to just kind of go through those as a checklist and see if your mentality is going in one direction or the other. And if you guys had a question that I didn't get to because I have to run, just tweet me at EM2WL uh, or I'm on any platform as Eat More to Way Less or at EM2WL. And if I did not get to your question, I will try to go back and answer it then. And if you don't know anything about what this Eat More to Weigh Less stuff is about, there's a link in my bio that you can click the little Perry guy, whichever side he's on. And you can click that link and it'll give you a free guide and video series of everything that Eat More to Weigh Less is about. And it kind of gives you the step-by-step -step for this plan. So I am going to run and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.